Here at Heart of Glass, the podcast, it's our responsibility to make sure that this is the safest listening experience and watching experience for everyone involved. That being said, today's episode talks a lot throughout the entire episode about drug usage. So if that's something that you're sensitive to, we would recommend skipping to the next episode. Thank you so much, and we hope you have a great listening and watching experience. Welcome back to the Heart of Glass podcast, the show that takes a deeper, more intimate look at the awesome people who make up the heartbeat of the Glass City. My name is Ashley Cohn, and I'm your host, and I'm so excited to be back here in Toledo Spirits again filming. They have been our amazing sponsor this season, and if you haven't had a chance to try their Heart of Glass vodka, which is a big part of our partnership, make sure to check it out. It's incredibly smooth. They use real strawberries in it, and it's delicious. If that's not your jam, they have a wide variety of other excellent spirits to check out, and the vibe here is incredible, so you should definitely come check it out in person at some point. Today's guest was born and raised here in Toledo. She's a musician, an entrepreneur, and social influencer in the music space. Her life's mission is to provide the youth of Toledo with more job opportunities in creative realms. And everything that she does is centered around the creative revitalization of our city and its residents. She's definitely one of the most driven people that I've ever met, and I'm excited for all of you to soak up her inspiration along with me. So Glass City Humans, I give you Abby Sarabia. Hello. Abby, thank you for being here. Yes, of course. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so stoked that you're here too. Um, I know when we initially got to sit down for the first time, mm -hmm. I was just so excited about your energy and your excitement for what we're doing. Yes and your passion for what you're doing and the mission that, that you're trying to accomplish. So I am so excited for our, our greater Toledo community yeah. to get to know you better because you're a person that I think some people don't know that really should know you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You. And especially considering what you're you're doing for the creative community specifically yeah. and musicians and emerging musicians. I'm really excited later on in our interview to really get into the nitty gritty of what you're doing because yeah. I know I have some friends personally in our music community mm. that that will be very happy that they've been able to make a connection with you and get to know you yes, better. Yes. You ready to do this? Yes, I am. I'm Let's so dive excited. Into it. All, All right. right. So from what you said in your story, it sounds like the beginning years of your life were extremely tumultuous and you were you were very candid about that. Yeah. Um, you began your story by stating that you were born into a life of chaos, and that's yeah. a that's a pretty strong statement to come right out of the gate yeah. with with what your younger life was like. So, can you elaborate on what that life of chaos was that you came into? Yeah, absolutely. So, growing up, um, you know, I would I would like to preface this by saying, unfortunately, that my story is not unique. Um, I, I feel like I'm actually one of the lucky ones that that share my story, which is a huge motivation as to why. I continue to push for our youth so hard, but uh, growing up, my parents were drug dealers, um, and my father specifically had a major addiction to cocaine. Um, so my life was only as stable as the drug income, um, and I think anybody who has experience with addiction or people that they love who are addicts, you really understand what that dark word entails. Um, right, addiction is so so traumatizing. It's so emotional. Um, it's so never ending in a sense. And so dealing with that at a young age really allowed me to build a resilient resilient mindset, I yeah. think. Um, I love my parents. My family are amazing. We all have great relationships now. Um, but being born, and that kind of chaos was definitely tough. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Is that it was tough? Yeah, very tough. You know, I think, I don't think anyone wants to have to be resilient. Right, <laughs> you yeah. Know, I, I, think, yeah. I think sometimes resiliency gets gets glorified a little bit absolutely. in that it's something that, that you absolutely want to be. But I think what so a true. lot of people don't understand is you become resilient yeah. by facing extreme adversity. Mm -hmm. And and so if you can let that extreme adversity then make you a resilient person, yep. that's that's awesome. And I'm so glad that you, you were able to take 
what was a very obviously negative experience growing yeah. up and help that fortify you and turn you into a resilient person, which obviously later on in life yeah. has helped to further what you're wanting to do. Very well said, very well said. I couldn't have said it better myself because you are absolutely right. Resilience comes as a product of adversity and adversity always comes as a product of trauma. Tra <laughs> trauma club night, you know what I mean, right? right? So yeah, um, I agree with you. Thank you. Absolutely. So I also appreciate that you recognize the ripple effect that your childhood had on the rest of your life in yeah. general. I can tell that, already tell just by the, the pieces that you were putting together about your own life that you're a very introspective, self-aware person. Yeah. And, and you understand that where we start doesn't determine where we end up, but it does have an influence on it. 100%. So I know that your experience has made you a stronger, more resilient individual. I'm also grateful that you're willing to discuss your mental health because we, yeah. we have a big focus on that here because yeah. it's really important for all of us to focus on our mental health so that we can be the best that we can be for ourselves and for others. Yeah. So you believe that your experience in childhood is a huge part of your bipolar one diagnosis? Yes, bipolar two. Bipolar two, yes, I, I apologize. No, you're okay. You're so right. I, I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate though? Because I think some people don't realize that part of some of, some of these um, mental disorders yeah. actually almost have like a button to them to yeah. trigger them. And, and if you experience a lot of trauma in your youth, that can actually work to trigger those things. 100%. So can you elaborate a little more on why you do feel like your childhood definitely influenced that? And can you also kind of explain for our listeners and watchers yeah. how the two correlate your life experience and also receiving that diagnosis later on? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, so just a quick over overview of what bipolar two disorder is, is it is a um, personality disorder where I have essentially peaks and valleys of moods, um, peaks being hypomania and valleys being um, very severe depression. And Peaks typically last about um, a few days, like five days to seven days, and depressive episodes last anywhere from two weeks to one month. And so growing up, I think it's also important to say too, before I get into that, is that bipolar two is a genetic, but also two environmental. Um, so I think growing up in an environment that had a lot of emotional turmoil, I've seen, uh, the deepest depths of, of anger, right? Of uh, sadness, of depression, of yeah. all of these extreme emotions that I feel kind of set up my mood spectrum for myself as an adult, sure. if that makes sense. So essentially, if I was never, if I never seen complete chaos, I wouldn't really know what that looks like. So I wouldn't be able to tap in to that necessarily, right? And I think seeing all of those very mature, very intense emotions at a young age all throughout my childhood set up my emotional spectrum very wide. And so now that it has affect my adult life, what that kind of looks like is for me, um, it's my depression. My depression can get really, really low. I can get very dark and I think that that Again, it's genetic, but I also think that because I was so apt to that when I was younger, that that's a place that I can easily tap into, that I yeah. have to be conscientious of. I understand that. Um, my my sister actually likes to affectionately call that headspace leaning toward melancholy, that some people okay, yeah. just generally lean toward melancholy. And I do yeah. think some people do tend to just... Honestly, their natural state is a little bit lower and it does right. take more to pull yourself up. Absolutely. And I mean, on the end of that spectrum too, with a life, with a childhood that I had, it was very dependent on money and drugs, right? Mm -hmm. So you have money and drugs, life is great. I mean, as a kid, I mean, I shouldn't say great because you know, you're still seeing violence and you're still seeing all these things. But as a kid, you don't really know the difference if that's your normal. But when you have all of those things and you have a affluent life, so to speak, um, on the other end of that spectrum, my hypomania, that's sometimes what I feel like I kind of chase, right? Is like um, yeah. having everything, being really secure, feeling good, uh, not worried about a paycheck or how I'm going to do this or that. And 
Yeah, I think I think those two end of the spectrums is where I can easily, where I find myself tapping into at least. Um, and I, when I get there, I kind of know. It, it's hard to identify when yeah. you're in a peak or valley or anything like that because it's a mood, right? So sometimes I really feel like, no, I just, I feel really good today. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I can really just knock out 13 hours of productivity and, and do stuff like that and not kind of realizing, all right, maybe I'm on the the verge of a peak. But when I am able to identify those moods that I felt when I was younger, that is how I reel myself back in and at that point usually do like a mental check-in. When did you get diagnosed? I got diagnosed last year and okay. I was almost coming up on my anniversary of diagnosis. Wow. Yeah, in uh, September, I believe. Do you yeah. feel like having the actual diagnosis has helped you feel a little bit more sense of peace from the fact that you have you have a label to put on it 100%. which then gives you the tools to be able to explore how to best help yourself one million percent one yes um the day that my therapist suggested that she may think that i fall under this diagnosis um i went home and i looked it up and i was just like yes 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 it really helped me identify what was going on inside because I this is why I love mental health so much because I think when you don't know what's going on inside you only blame yourself and That's that is true. a really dark place to be right I why can't I get motivated like why can't I do these things like I there's have, just something inherently wrong with who yes, you are as a person. exactly and yeah. then you're trying to fix that yeah and that's not the issue at all and so when I was able to label the diagnosis and learn more about it and see that I'm not unique in terms of something that's wrong with me or I don't have to go on this whole journey of finding myself or whatever it is that I thought I was lacking uh, it it made my life a lot easier and it also made my life a lot harder for the following three months Bet. Uh, because then I always felt like something was wrong with me. I always felt like there were times that I couldn't align with the actions I was doing or the words that I was saying. And again, I went on this whole journey of trying to find myself, but when I was able to learn about those things, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. That's all right. What was I saying? You were just talking about having the knowledge of the diagnosis and having the power that goes along with that and being able to say, this isn't just all my fault because I'm not yeah. just an, an inherently a bad person. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I guess long story short, finding that diagnosis was very helpful for me because you, again, you just get to see like, okay, I am not the problem. And I, I mean, we are right a little I get bit the distinction but that you're saying though it's not like what i'm hearing you say is not that you're excusing all behavior because you know it's just not my fault this isn't yes, my fault so it's right. not my responsibility what i'm hearing you say is that having that power of knowing what what that label is yeah. allows you to look at yourself and say okay this is not because I'm inherently flawed. This is not because I'm a bad person. Right, right. There's a reason for this and there are external influences. Yes. It doesn't it doesn't mean that I have no responsibility in this. I think recognizing that yeah. something's not your is not your fault doesn't negate the responsibility that's there. Yep. It just empowers you to then have the tools to say, "Okay, this is what's going on. It's not my fault." but it is my responsibility to take to care of it. myself, whatever yep. that might mean for yep. each individual person. Yes, thank you for that reminder. Yes, 100%. Yeah. And then to gap back what I was saying, the following months were hard was because I had to kind of reflect on my life yeah. and these moments that I felt like maybe I did bad things or maybe I hurt people and ask myself, was this you or can Ooh. you attest this to some type of hypomanic or maybe depressive episode that was affecting your behavior. And so in those three months, I did kind of have to relive some of the darkest moments of my life and some of the most, you know, hurtful times for myself and for others. And, you know, open those wounds back up, kind of get closure with my behavior and then boom, how do I manage it moving forward? Absolutely. And so ever since then, it's really just been a managing, managing game. There's no you can't fix it, right? right. I, I always tell my therapist, like, I often say, like, I wish I was just 
or when I'm hypomanic because I'm, I'm a Capricorn. So I like to get work done. That's just like something <laughs> that, that fulfills me. So my hypomania really pa pairs well with my natural state. With that extreme productivity. Exactly. Yes. So when I'm in hypomania, a lot of the times I think like, man, I wish I could just be this way all the time. Like, I wish this is really who I was. And when I have those conversations with my therapist, she reminds me, no, Abby, this, this is who you really are. And your depressive episodes are who you are as well. Just along with your, you know, regular personality, your job is just to manage it. And so, definitely. So that that's helped a lot too. Like this is me, and I know now that I work in waves, and it's not. I don't expect myself to be that productivity monster, 365 days a year, and that kind of alleviates a little bit of self pressure that I that I put on myself. That's good. I think I think when we can get to a point where we can appreciate ourselves in in every single space that mm -hmm. we're in and learn to work with ourselves in those spaces. Yeah. That's, I can tell that you've done a lot of, of work on yourself, even Thank just since you. finding out what you know now about yourself. Absolutely, and even depressive episodes, this is kind of like my next phase. I've learned to manage my hypomania pretty well, not drinking, eating well, um, sleeping well, things like that. But the depressive episodes is more so of a mental thing. I can, I can tell I'm in a valley when my internal talk begins to get very cynical, mm. very negative, because usually my internal talk is like, you're that bitch, or like, you got this today. <laughs> so, when, so when it's a little different, I'm like, okay, maybe some, some, something else is tapping in, in here, but I think the, the best thing that's helped me in those valleys is to take an objective stance to my thoughts and then also validate them as well. I think my lows have a really unique way of showing what I need to work on, showing what I'm insecure about. If I'm constantly talking to myself negatively about this one subject, then I know I need to dive deeper. And not that, that it's gonna fix anything, but it just allows me to understand myself even more, even better. Which really, that's what we're all trying to do is understand ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, I sure. love that you're so willing to talk so openly about the part of your life that encompasses mental health. Yeah. Because it, one, you know it resonates with other people. Mm -hmm. I do, I think the more that we talk about our stories, particularly that aspect of it, it, it adds more more self empowerment to it too. Yeah, one hundred percent. So let's rewind back a little bit. Okay. And let's talk about basketball for a second. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you said that after things started to fall into place with your family, you're kind of moving out of chaos a little bit. Yeah. Yep. You became heavily involved with basketball and yes. even ended up playing college ball. Yes. Why did you love the game so much? And then ultimately, what took you out of it? In full transparency, I think my love for the game began as um, a want from my parents. I think my dad coming, so the reason that things got better uh, is that my dad ended up getting sober, you know, just falling in line and, and living that civil life. And so when he came back, something that was always instilled with him is sports. So he was a football player, he was a D1 collegiate athlete, and then you know, somewhere along the way he got lost and ended up yeah. becoming what he became at that time. So I think he understood the importance of having something to focus on that's bigger than you. And at a young age, it's usually sports, right? Because right. we're in America. So Absolutely. <laughs> well, I guess that's anywhere. And so basketball to me though was a to-do up until the point of high school where I really began to like love my teams. I really began to love the people I was spending so much time with. Um, and what was the second part of your question? What ultimately took you out of basketball? What ultimately took me out of basketball was freshman year of college. It was our first tournament game and I dislocated my knee. And um, that Ouch. was in February. And then that's like a six week to two month healing process. And then a month in, I contracted mono. Oh, so mono man. had me out for like another two months. So I was like, I shouldn't say immobile, but I was definitely not functioning at sure at a normal, you know, at my normal rate for about three months. And then I think I just kind of lost passion for it. At that point, that was really when I was like diving into recording music in my free time and okay. falling in love with that and then just conspiring on how I can come back to Toledo and pursue music. 
uh, because at the end of the day, I was a Division Three athlete, so I knew that in terms of longevity, it was either looking like I was going to be a coach or I wasn't going to necessarily probably go to the WNBA, right? Okay. So, kind of cut ties with basketball, and then as soon as as soon as that happened, I finished out my semester at Defiance College, and then came back to Toledo, started as a DJ, and worked my way up from there. Why was it important to you to come back to Toledo? I think at that time, I definitely did not have the vision that I have now for Toledo. I think it was important for me because I needed to be surrounded by my family. I needed to be sense. surrounded by my support system. And quite frankly, the University of Toledo and their business program is amazing. That's <laughs> so awesome. in terms of schooling, that, that worked out in a in addition to being a lot cheaper as well. What do you see in our city now that you feel like you missed, that you were just kind of sleeping on prior to coming back? Oh my God, so much. The culture here, the ambition here, the people. I really didn't know that the artsy, open-minded, uh, visionary people were all around us. I had no idea. Most definitely. And I was 16. Yeah, you know, I was 17, 18 years old in high school and the time that I spent in Toledo. So it makes sense. And of course, in the athletic realm. So always around people like that. So it would make sense that I never got to see that side. Um, but when I started to dive into that side, I was like, holy shit, mm -hmm. a lot of people actually have this same goal. And so that planted the seed to what I decided to do today. Well, when you really get into the heart of art and music culture here, mm -hmm. as I know you've seen, Toledo is filled with hustlers and hard workers yes. who really do put everything they have into into their craft. And so yeah. when you get a when you get a peek at that, especially if that lives with inside you, mm -hmm. uh, Toledo is a very inspirational city, especially when you take a look at yeah. the arts and the music scene. One hundred percent. And I think the reason that it inspires me today is because I know what we come from. Mm. I know that we come from nothing essentially, sure. right? I know that anything that is created here is created from the concrete up. And to me, that is the most beautiful part about about the city. Like my favorite example of a Toledo creative is Nightheart. Mm. And um, I'm not sure if you heard of him, but he is a rapper and also the CEO of his brand. And you know, all, all that great stuff that comes along with it. But when I met him, he was 16 years old and he was homeless. Wow. And he was still performing at Ottawa Tavern every 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 weekend. He was still finding rides to any studio sessions that he possibly could. He was finding a way to make it happen. Fast forward years later, uh, his Saturday album release party, he actually just held a fundraiser for the same shelter that housed him and his mom wow, when he was homeless. Awesome. And so stuff like that, I'm just like, it's the grit, like you said, yeah. it's the hardworking people that man people just don't know about mm -hmm. and we we break this ceiling open and we're gonna be a hard hard population to compete with it's true you're not the first guest that's used the word grit to describe mm -hmm. toledo yeah and, and and the people that inhabit it it's true we have we have a tough population yeah here. that's willing to put in the work yeah i agree so let's talk about diving into your music career. So yeah. you, you waved goodbye to basketball. Yes. And you dove into music and did not look back. So DJing, nope. as you said, became a huge part of your life, mm -hmm. as well as writing and producing. And it sounds like you dove fully into the behind the scene aspects of it too, yeah. really soaking up everything and learning everything that you could. So can you share with me what launching your music career was like for you mm -hmm. and what skills you gained from investing yourself completely in that process? Oh yeah, absolutely. My career, I would say I went in blind. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know much about anything, but I began as a DJ when I came home from college. Um, and I literally started just messaging bars bars on Facebook that were local, seeing if they needed something. And honestly, for the first like month, I was DJing for free. Um, and then, you know, gigs build up. And then I fell out of love with the club scene because I was in school. 
So it was a lot to DJ like from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. and then wake up for class I and bet. try to be a functioning person. So once I saved up enough money to get a cheap little uh, focus right, a cheap mic and the software to record, I just went so hard for about a year doing that, learning that, learning the basics of engineering. Um, but at that point, I was then recording in my mom's garage. So I was like, okay, I need a space. So then I got a space um, on Monroe Street, Toledo, and then kind of opened it up as a studio. And there I really fell in love with the behind the scenes action of networking, of like managing, of just more so of the business rather than the creative. I noticed when I had the studio, the creative, I was like, oh, can somebody like, can I bring somebody in to record? Cause I would rather have the conversation and I don't know, just do, kind of the operational stuff of it, right? Sure. Sorry. Making everything run smoothly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, but through that, I learned the basic skill sets that you need as a musician, which is engineering, which is recording, and which is networking, right? So then, um, after the recording studio, really that allowed me to take my own personal music career very seriously, um, which was awesome, and released a few singles that got on the radio, won a few competitions, sold out a few shows, nice. broke a record or two. And then that brought me really into about 2019, 2020, and still in college. And then once 2020 hit, I knew there was going to be a major shift. Um, I also knew at this point I had collected so much, you know, data using myself as the object. I knew what I needed to succeed if I could have gone back two years. Okay. Right. So yeah. I knew that, okay, maybe if I had this in 2018, maybe if I had access to this in 2018, it would have put me in a different, a different level than where I'm at now. So just kind of thinking like that um, and, and taking note of what I wish I could create for other people. Um, my friend Baywood too was a huge influence and he's also Jordan. from- Jordan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do yeah. you know Jordan? I do know Jordan. <laughs> yeah, he is honestly, <laughs> I, I would probably say the reason why I'm, I'm here today with Creators Club. Yeah. Was Cause he was really the one who inspired me to think bigger. Yeah. Think bigger. Like him, he released, for those who don't know Jordan Baywood, he started off as a producer and as an own, own music artist. And through his technical skill sets that he learned, he developed audio presets, um, which are doing extremely well. They are. And so what he, how he framed it to me is think about what you do for artists in the day to day and learn how to make it digital. And I was like, okay, coaching, branding, artists are always asking me about marketing. How can I make this like, how can I just develop a resource? Yeah. That artists, I can make once and artists can use a million times. Um, all these things in motion, 2020 happens, I graduate college. I'm kind of phased out of the music, uh, just cause at that point it was really hard to keep up with. Uh, it sounds like too, you, you grabbed on very quickly to enjoying the bird's eye view look of everything, the Love operations it. aspect of yeah. everything, where you know you know a lot about every single aspect of it. So it's not like you've chosen this one specific thing where you're you're the recording artist and that is strictly it. Mm -hmm. You've learned everything about how to make that that vehicle move. Yes, everything yeah. that encompasses that. And I actually noticed specifically when you said the word networking, your eyes like lit up yes. about it. So I can tell. I know because of the conversations that we've had, networking for you is a huge thing and something that you really, really work with your artists mm -hmm. to help them understand the importance of it. Yes. And that that being someone who is a good networker is an invaluable skill to have. Yes, 1000%. Yes. Networking is another reason I am here today. Um, to me, there is nothing more powerful than human connection. and. Honestly, I've learned that in marketing. I've learned that in branding. I've learned that in advertising. The number one way to make a human move is to connect with them. And so I think 
I've always had an approachable personality. I've always been somebody that I, I like making friends. I think it's, it's easy for me, right? And I know it's not the case for some people. I know some people are really introverted and, and maybe need a little help with it. But networking, man, and building relationships is, is you want to move something forward, build a relationship with somebody who's already done that. And that's just so, so powerful connecting and networking so powerful that that is really powerful I I love that you said that 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 makes so much sense to me if you're wanting to accomplish something if you're wanting to move a project forward why would you not then mm -hmm. look to the people that haven't just also done that or who aren't actively doing it but that have yes. done it and they've done it really really well yeah so that makes that only makes sense to me to constantly be seeking out uh, almost mentors basically yeah. even if those people don't realize they're being mentors to you mm -hmm. but people to look to and say okay this is what i want they've done this they didn't just do it but right but they they were incredible at doing it and yeah. very successful so what's your secret kind of a yeah thing? absolutely and like a few things one i'm smirking because my dad you know him being a him being previously an addict and having that recovery life, you know, recovery people just have the smartest shit to say about life because they know how to get through it. And he always tells me like, shut the fuck up and listen to someone who's been there before you. <laughs> and I, I swear to God, that's, that is great <laughs> advice and that's what you have to do. Yes. You know, you have to just ask someone who has been there before you and listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, here I go, losing my train of thought again. Huh? It's all right. Together we will get it back yeah, on track. Yeah, yeah. So he he shared he shared that piece of advice with you to, to shut the fuck up and and listen to other people. Listen. Oh, okay. And here's my other point too with connecting. I think sometimes with when people hear the word networking, they often think it has like some kind of insidious intention behind it, right? And networking is really just seeing if our relation, like seeing if the vibe is there mm -hmm. naturally, and then adding the pieces to the puzzle later. Mm -hmm. Networking is just going in, being yourself, attracting like like minds, exactly. and then figuring out how you guys can help each other in the long run. And even for, um, I think this is also a common mistake people make when networking, they always try to reach up. They always try to reach vertically. There's so much power in reaching laterally mm -hmm. to people who maybe have did not have a super successful time doing what you were trying to do, but they can still give you all of these tips and tricks on how to not fuck up the way that they did. Absolutely. Right, and save you some time on that end too. So there's so much power in relationship and relationship I think comes way before networking. Networking is almost secondary. And you should just be making friends that like the same shit you do. Most definitely. That's, that's <laughs> no. so true. I actually feel like you're giving really good advice for how to make friends as an adult. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's funny because I, I, I tell <laughs> I tell people all the time, music is the only way I know really how to start conversations with people. It's such a, it's such an, a, a, what's the word, a scapegoat. I want to talk to a pretty girl. If she likes music, guess what we got in common, right? If I want to go <laughs> talk to a professional with a suit on, Let's talk about music. It's just, it's something that's always, it's your scapegoat to start conversation. That's so true. We could have, we could have a whole other really yeah. long conversation <laughs> about that because I am a firm believer that music, it literally is the bridge that kind of brings yeah. everybody together. 100%. So I love that. That's such a, that's actually a really good piece of advice yeah. about how to just begin building a relationship with someone. And that's so true because I've spoken to very few people in my life that don't like music. It's, right. You know, right. occasionally there's somebody out there that says, I don't really listen to music. Yeah. I don't really understand that, but I know they do exist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, but they do. But for most people, music is a thing that, that is a unifier. Yeah, but and that everybody has their own opinion on it. Definitely. Right. So yeah, 100%. And I think one valuable networking skill I've always learned is just ask people about themselves. That's true. In an in a, in a, in initiating conversation, don't be the person doing the most of the conversation. Be the person asking the most questions. Um, you get people to talk about themselves, and then you have a common topic that you're, you yeah. both are passionate about, you will walk away with a relationship with that person. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. Thank that you. is great advice. And following up too, like there's so much power in ending the conversation with, I'd love to connect with you. Do you have an email or social media I can follow you on? This is where people drop the ball. 
link back up, whether it's a DM or an email or you're showing love by commenting, reposting, liking that person and just saying, hey, it was great connecting with you. I love the conversation. Let me know how I could help if you ever need anything. Um, and along with that, like backtracking a little bit ago about building up those technical skills, the power also in networking is leveraging your own talents. How can I help you? How can you help me? And sometimes a lot of artists go in blind, just reaching. And that's what people don't like. That's a big no-no. Don't have your hand out. Don't ask for something with no intention to provide something back. But when you have a technical mm -hmm. skill set, like recording or mixing or video editing or content creation, it's almost a swap of yeah, services. Yeah, that's exactly what it was making mm -hmm. me think of. It's yep. kind of like you're bartering services. Yeah, so even if you are now reaching for somebody who's a little bit ahead of you, now they look at you as somebody who they can swap services with as opposed to somebody who's trying to ask them for something. And that in their mind has so much so much power in shifting, you know, that relationship. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So all of this seems like a really good point to get in deep about Creators Club. Yes. Because all the all the advice that you're sharing, I know because I follow you and Creators Club very extensively on social media. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. At, mainly because beyond the fact that we we networked, we right. built that relationship. You know what you're talking about. And even even in dealing with this, I know that this is not a musical endeavor, yeah. but especially in dealing with crafting content, mm -hmm. figuring out how to effectively connect with your audience, you really know your stuff. So yeah. even beyond just the musicians and the musical realm in which you, you reside and you're helping people, what what you have to say and what you have to offer really does resonate outside of strictly just the music community. Thank you. Absolutely. I've been getting that a lot too. And so I've been trying to think of ways or like, maybe I don't, but I've been trying to think of ways of making my content more universal because people who do follow me are like, listen, I've never played an instrument a day in my life, but the but things that you are saying resonates into my my career field or anything like that. So I think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. Maybe we just need to network more yeah. about it. We talk about a little more, right? For sure, for sure. <laughs> so talking talking about Creators Club specifically, so you recognize an extreme need in our area. Yeah. And you used your experience in public relations and all the confidence that you gained from doing that, that that was instilled in you to start your own community to meet that need. You saw that need and yeah. you wanted to meet it. So Tell me about Creators Club, how you came up, up with the awesome platform, mm -hmm. and ultimately what your goal was and has been with Creators Club. Yeah, absolutely. So starting backwards, my goal for Creators Club is to provide musicians with the same resources, same networking opportunities, and same ability to grow as any musician in the main core music hubs, whether that's Atlanta, New York, LA, whatever it is, I don't want musicians to feel like I have to move there to grow my career um, because that is so false and now with our landscape of digital platforms of social media all I had to figure out how to do was how to get the resources to them how to kind of package them all to where yep. they're in one place yep to where anybody can access because I was so inspired by Toledo and really just thinking like, okay, how how can I get Toledo artists the same the same opportunities? And then, so this all really began in, in 2020, after I graduated college, and after hearing those wise words from Baywood, okay, how do I make things digital? Creators Club began as a concept of, I just wanted to create a branding course, because at that time, that was like what I was an expert in, what most musicians were asking me about. And when I was doing market research, I, like all branding courses were just some white guy like talking for five hours and it was just not anything engaging or I wouldn't be able to retain much. Sure. So I was like, how do I build something that's a lot more engaging and just like looks better and feels better and has more to offer than just an e-course? And um, along my discovery, I developed or I found Mighty Networks. Um, which is the host network that Creators Club is derived off of. And Mighty Networks is incredible. And it can be incredible not only for musicians, but for whatever niches people have. Seriously, it's an awesome tool. And there, I mean, they really had everything set up. All I had to do was plug in the information and, and find the team that was equally as passionate about creating basically a library nice. for musicians. Um, 
and then worked my ass off to develop that basically in September of 2020. And then we launched, Creative Club officially launched in April 2021. That's awesome. And now, uh, September 2022, we have about well over 1,100 musicians worldwide that we're providing access uh, of resources, community, and knowledge to. We do live events where we connect our musicians with industry professionals so they get that same feeling of being in the room with the people that they need to be and want to be in the room with. Um, and I mean, we just have a lot of cool stuff in motion. So yeah, really having Toledo in mind all the way through because I want Creators Club to be the difference for an artist here. Definitely. Well, and, and a, what a lot of people might know is beyond just having the marketing knowledge, having the networking knowledge mm -hmm. and the studio knowledge, what a lot of people might not realize is you really do have the experience to back it up considering who you've gotten got had the opportunity to work yeah. with. You've worked with some very impressive people. Can you yeah. can you talk a little bit about some of some of the major artists that you've gotten to work with and what you've learned from working with yeah, them? Yeah, absolutely. And this is an important thing to note as well because I think this really inspired me uh, to believe in the vision of Creators Club is that in August of 2020, I networked with Olivia Shallow, who is the CEO and founder of Amethyst, which is a PR agency. Nice. And it was literally an Instagram DM. Uh, according to her, it was crafted well, and that's why she responded. Um, but that leveraged, that gave me the opportunity to work with Trippy Red, to work with Quavo, um, of Migos and work on their content and things like that. And when I, I mean, I remember like after I sent the work in for Quavo stuff, I was like, I didn't do it. I didn't move. Like I, I didn't move from my seat in Toledo, Ohio behind in my apartment. And so I know if I can do this, any other kid in this city can do it as well. They just have to have that access and they have to have that knowledge of knowing how to do things or how to reach out. But that was a really, really big moment where I was like, Creators Club absolutely has potential to make a difference in Definitely. this community. So yeah, so got to work with um, Quavo and, and Trippy, and then Creators Club also caught the attention of Mark Urselli, who is a Grammy award winning nice. audio engineer. He's worked with like, Patti LaBelle, U2, uh, Luther Vandross. I mean, that dude is nuts. And along the way, just really building relationships with people who are doing other amazing things in New York and LA and on bigger platforms. Um, and we're all just trying to connect the pieces on how to make it equal, Definitely. you know? So um, if you were talking to an emerging musician that is not familiar with Creators Club at yeah. this point, what would you say to them is the reason that it is absolutely essential for them to take advantage of this resource? It is truly just a tool that's going to help you develop your career. It is a place that you can find a community if you're looking for one, whether that's artists who are in the same genre as you, whether you're looking for a producer who can produce, you know, your type of music. Um, it will connect you with the industry professionals you are trying to grab the attention of at the end of the day. You have opportunities to do those things, um, but it is just a tool in the toolbox. And by no means is it the only tool, right? That I would, I would never encourage musicians to be like, use Creators Club and Creators Club only, because right. at the end of the day, the more resources, the better. Absolutely. So it is just a powerful tool to have in your toolbox and it's free. That's that's the thing is I think it's very rare to be able to find all the all the pieces of information yeah. and all of the connection opportunities that you're providing all in one place and I, yeah. I from my vantage point that's the key that I see with this is yeah. is it is it's every everything in one place and then you mentioned that it's free why has it been important to you to keep it from being cost prohibitive for people 100% because of accessibility I know that that's important. I know being a Toledo artist, um, and it's not even a Toledo artist, being a young teenage artist, like 60 bucks to spend on a cover art was like maybe a third of my paycheck. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So um, like 
thinking about things like that. And <clears throat> one thing that I have not mentioned is that I am a director of marketing for Northwest Ohio's number one school-based mental health agency. Nice. So I work really closely with kids and with mental health. And one of the huge things that kids don't access mental health is because they have barriers, right? Accessibility, accessibility to appointments, accessibility to uh, finances for funds to pay for the appointments. And so kind of taking what I learned there and also understanding it, it translates no matter what you're doing. You should always assume people have a hard time accessing things um, via money, via transportation, education, whatever it is, and try to make it as easy and as accessible as possible. So you're working on breaking down those barriers then? Yes. That's yep. awesome. Yep. And community and education, I got to give Baywood credit for this. He taught me should always be free, no matter what. There's no reason why anybody should charge for a community or to improve, you know, what you know about a topic. That's a valuable piece of advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So I know you have a really big heart for youth in general. Yes. I know that's fueled based on your own experiences yeah. and knowing what it's like having your own barriers. So I feel like this is a perfect time to talk about the Sarabia Family Foundation. Yes. So you are a co-founder yes. of the foundation. Can you tell me about the great work that your foundation is doing? Absolutely. And how it's helping to positively impact the youth right in our community. Yeah, 100%. So me and my father founded the Sarabia Family Foundation together in honor of um, our grandparents who have passed away. And essentially it's what we're doing. We, we definitely have long-term visions, but for right now, what we are doing is a scholarship, uh, a scholarship reward for what we like to call adverse students, because we know the smart kids get the scholarships, right? We know the kids with perfect attendance get the scholarships, but what me and my father know is that those aren't the kids who are achieving greatness all the time. It's the kids who maybe have parents as drug addicts, but still find a way to get to school every day. Maybe they're not getting good grades, but maybe they don't have a bed to sleep on and they can't stay awake during school. You know what I mean? Like there's so many of these situations that our youth goes through that makes them so adverse. And these are the ones we don't want to miss. We want to make sure these are the ones that still have that opportunity to succeed, just like the A plus students, the perfect attendance students, things like that. So we were able to reward our first scholarship recipient of Woodward High School uh, with ten thousand dollars, awesome. yeah, and um, wow. for her college education, and she had a beautiful story. She lost her mother when she was young. Um, she had a child at sixteen years old. Is an amazing mother. Carries a three point four GPA. I mean, I don't even know how she does it. I would not be able to do to do that. So, yeah. looking for stories like that and wanting to give those kids the same same opportunity. That's incredible. Yeah, thank wow. you, thank yeah. you. And we're hoping to build it. Um, we're hoping to just do more creative things with it. Like, we're talking about maybe starting a, a coffee shop or maybe opening a restaurant. You know, just something that continues to give back to our youth that opens up more job opportunities for them and that gives them an extra support so they can succeed as well. That doesn't surprise me that you guys are looking for ways to make it even more effective because from where I'm sitting to me that that's very much who you are in general. Yeah. You, when you create something or come up with something and are putting something together I can tell that you're a person that doesn't look at it as as com ever completed yeah not in a toxic way but more of looking and saying you know in in general everything can always be improved upon mm -hmm. so how do we take this thing that has this amazing basis how do we continue to make it better yeah. and better absolutely so if you were trying to convince someone who has never been to Toledo to move to Toledo mm. what would your pitch be to them um, my pitch would be a that Toledo is probably the best place to bring your business to because cost of living is very cheap um, and that there is a lot of space for you to be your own person here. Mm. Um, Toledo by no means has a certain type of person that like we favor That's true. and so you can kind of find yourself here and not feel embarrassed about it if that makes sense it makes like total I, sense. I feel when people when they want to go to new york or la they want to bring this presence of themselves if you don't know that that's perfectly okay here 
because we're all building it. Salido is still building its own kind of presence Definitely. and things like that. So Definitely. That's yeah. that's a really that's a really good way to sell it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And home slice pizza. That's that's true. Home Mashed slice potato is pizza. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> that is my number one thing. And Toledo Spirits. Oh, Toledo Spirits. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, for honestly. no other reason. Come to Toledo for Toledo <laughs> for Spirits, real. right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, Abby, you you are awesome and inspirational and so creative. Thank you. And I'm so excited about your episode specifically because I know, like me, it took another person who knows you, another creative in town, yeah. to to give name recognition to you for me and, yeah. and for me to build that relationship with you. I'm so excited for other creatives out there and other people in general want to know that you created this amazing resource, yeah, to know you. that you are a resource and that you are in general rooting for people to do well in our city. Yes. And also that you're an incredible philanthropist and you're just, <laughs> you're helping. I mean, we, we are nothing without our youth and we're not mm -hmm. gonna be around forever. So it's important. I love that you get that it's so important to invest in our youth that are coming up in this town. So thank yeah. you, seriously, thank you for thank everything you. that that you are, are adding to our town and the many ways in which I can tell you want to see people succeed. Yes, I appreciate that so much. Thank yeah. you for doing this because Absolutely. I think musicians sometimes pigeonhole themselves into a vision of success. Yeah. And success looks like a lot of different things. You may not be making music every single day, but now you have built something so creative that other creatives can leverage for their platforms and it's a gift that keeps on giving. And so Thanks, Abby. thank you for doing this because you are absolutely igniting inspiration and somebody else is gonna have a trickle effect. It's just natural. And that's thank why you. execution on your dreams, no matter how big or how small, is so important because it has a trickle effect. And that trickle effect is what it's all about. Thank you. I I really do appreciate yes, the, the very kind and encouraging words. Of course. If you would, the floor is yours. Please look yes. right at this camera. All right. Tell people where they can find you and Creators Club and connect with you on social media. Okay. And if you have anything specific that you would like to promote, the floor is yours. Okay. Awesome. Say my name. Yeah. Go right. for it. Yeah. All right. Hey everyone. This is Abby Sarabia. You can find me on linktree.com slash Abby Sarabia. Again, that's linktree.com slash Abby Sarabia. There you will find access to Creators Club, all my social media networks, all of my freebies for musicians, and just so much more. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this amazing opportunity um, to be on the Glass City Podcast. Well, to all of you who are watching and listening today, thank you once again for tuning in, for taking out the time to listen to us or watch us. If you are watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you're not already following us on social media, you can find us on both Facebook and Instagram at Heart of Glass the Pod. We also have a link tree. It's just link tree slash Heart of Glass the Pod. There you can find every single resource that you could possibly need for the podcast. We just thank you so much for continuing to tune in with us and for taking the time to learn a little bit more about another awesome human who makes up the heartbeat of the Glass City. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.